This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again. It's Mises Weekends. Our guest is someone many of you are familiar with, Ryan McMakin, editor-in-chief of Mises.org. And today we are talking about one of our favorite subjects, which is decentralization and secession and breaking up these large political subdivisions that plague us, not only in, in the U.S., but around the world. But in particular, Ryan, today we're talking about both of our of, uh, former home state of California, uh, which now has a ballot measure that's going to appear in November to split that up into three states. And of course, the LA Times is posing this as radical, which, which you, you know, might imagine. But I want to start with, with mentioning that Tim Draper, the gentleman behind this, is not some sort of crank. He's not a left winger. Uh, he is a, a wealthy, apparently billionaire Silicon Valley venture capitalist. So this is a serious guy. This isn't, uh, you know, the, the kind of guy you might imagine is proposing it. Well, I, I don't know why it's portrayed as so radical uh, when you talk to people from California. And of course, even when I was a kid, it was it seemed kind of odd to many people that Sacramento was just so far away and Northern yeah. California was not seen as the same place as Southern California. So this idea that it's it's just one place and breaking it up would be this weird thing to do. Uh, I, I don't know who's coming up with that idea. It's true. If you live in Wyoming, for example, I don't think the state capital seems like such a faraway thing, a state with, with far less than a million people in it. And certainly my own experience living in Alabama, Montgomery the, and, and the state capital and your state legislator seems a lot closer to you than it ever did when I lived in California. Um, I want to bring up something that that's probably the biggest stumbling block to this scenario before we get into some of the benefits of decentralization. And that is, of course, the federal element to it. Uh, Article 4 would require congressional approval to break California into three states. I wonder if this couldn't be technically characterized or or implemented as something that simply created an intrastate uh, sort of three big glorified groups of counties that could bypass this because uh, I think a lot of people are not going to want six U.S. senators from the three Californias, for example. That that would be a stumbling block. I wonder if you, there there's a lot of things you might imagine you could do technically to to get around Article Four. Yes, well, and of course, ideally, what California does with its representation would be California's business. Uh, it it strikes right. me as somewhat odd that Congress should have to vote on something that essentially would not affect anyone else, um, except for the fact that it would create some more senators. But we're talking about four more senators out of 100. Mm -hmm. And if anything, then it increases the relative power of other states because it removes this gigantic voting block uh, in the Electoral College and in Congress in general uh, that would that would help other states. And but we're of course we are we're going to have to deal with that even if the voters vote for it in California. But yeah, as to the question of, well, couldn't you do something where there was better representation in the states, regionally speaking? Mm -hmm. And well, in the past that would have been a lot easier because uh, the Senate, uh, the state Senate in each case, was designed to be more territorially based, where you'd have kind of a, a more of a federalist sort of system within each state, so each county would have a senator and then certain regions would get a senator. The idea would, was that you would help increase the representation of underpopulated places and that the less populated places wouldn't just be dominated by the cities. Uh, and the, you could easily, if that was allowed to stand by the federal courts, which it wasn't, that, that idea of representation was struck down in the 1960s uh, as, as not conforming to the one man, one vote ideal. And so that's gone. The question is, if states try to do something like that today, would then the federal courts tolerate it? I don't know. I guess we would have to look at some actual proposals where they were doing that. But I, but I agree. There's potentially some in-between measures that you could do. Well, you point out one of the things that's driving this in an article you wrote on Mises Org this week is that California is just too big. It, it doesn't have enough representatives. It's too far away. And, and I think it's bumming up against about 40 million people, which makes it larger than many, many countries across the world. I wonder if there's an ideal size uh, for an administrative unit if you believe in the state and that California's just wildly exceeded it. And that's why in general, not always, but in general, places like Switzerland and Norway are happier than places like Russia and Germany and the U.S. 
Right. Keep in mind that Norway has 5 million people, yeah. which is yeah. the same as Minnesota or Colorado. And so that's not even the same league as a place like California. And of course, mm -hmm. you would feel that you actually have some stake in the game, much more so in a place where you're one of 5 million versus one of 40 million, uh, especially when your territory is physically smaller, too. You people are actually sharing more space in common. It's, it's a totally different ballgame when you're talking about a place like California. Now, as a decentralism minded person, mm -hmm. I, uh, the question is, well, is there an ideal size? I'd say, hey, New Hampshire's the ideal size, right? You got, I don't know, was it about a million people, I think? And maybe even less than that, maybe 750,000. Uh, and uh, uh, Vermont next door is similar too. And so both of those places have two senators and one representative. Yeah. They have extremely low crime. Uh, and if you look at their representation, their state legislatures, it's it's wonderful in in this respect, in that I think there's only about 3,000 people per legislative district uh, in New Hampshire, which has 400 legislators. Uh, no, just 400 members of the House. California, for 40 million people, has 120. So that gives you, and so their district size then per state legislator is about 300,000. So to even call both of these places democracies uh, kind of makes a mockery of the term. But it's interesting. I think Americans, especially libertarians, f don't think enough about the relative degrees of freedom between the states in the U.S. because everything seems federalized. We pay a lot more in federal taxes than state. But between the states, amongst which you can move without a passport, by the way, without anyone's permission, between the states, there are huge differences in how much they tax and regulate and run your life. You can move today. So why can't we recreate that within an existing state like California? Right. It would make perfect sense. And when you look at the size of some of these states, uh, like San Bernardino County, I believe, in California is larger than Rhode Island. Sure. And so that should be its own state right there. And it has plenty of people, especially by historical standards, especially when, when people talk about how a state's too small popul or an area is too small population wise to be its own state. Well, they're completely forgetting the past where California in its entirety once had 50,000 people or something to that. Uh, and of course, their legislature size made sense back then. But we're talking about standard practice in America for a state to have a million people or less in many cases. And so you obviously don't need this gigantic place with 10 million people for it, historically speaking, to uh, to count as something that we would consider and recognize to be American government. So, yeah, we've talked about this many times on Mises.org. The issue of moving from state to state with ease is that's a good thing that people yeah, can do that. Yeah, but the absolutely. larger the states get, the more irrelevant that becomes. If the United States was composed of two states and in order to escape uh, Los Angeles, uh, the, the state government in Los Angeles, you had to move to Kentucky. Well, I mean, how easy is that? How often is that going to happen? It, it's mitigated by the fact, OK, you can move to Phoenix now from Los Angeles and still probably drive to see family and that sort of thing. The human scale matters. And so by making these states smaller, even if it's just three, I would, of course, argue that three states out of one is far too few. But this would be a huge improvement where now all you got to do is move from L.A. County to Orange County uh, or to Riverside County. I mean, that, that's a big deal in terms of making it easier to move around and move your business and your assets around as well. Right. The other thing a lot of people don't understand is that the, the entire northern half of the state above San Francisco is a lot more like Oregon or Washington than it is what we think of California. The inland parts of the state uh, have country music on the radio, uh, Mexican migrant workers. They're a lot more like Arizona and Nevada than they are like Hollywood. So, But, but I want to bring up a, a one historical example. We can go back to just the early 1990s and look at the former Yugoslavia which broke up into seven countries. Now, now in, in the former Yugoslavia, you have some ethno-national differences, you have some religious differences, and even some linguistic differences. But if you fast forward to present-day California, you could say, well, there are, there are still distinctions driving this, urban versus rural, uh, secular versus religious, even if you don't have all the different religions involved. I mean, there's still cultural divides in the U.S. that are every bit as real, I would argue, as those divides in the former Yugoslavia, those divisions but they're different, and they, they could draw, help drive the what we would argue would be sort of natural political subdivisions. Yeah, people tend to congregate with other people whose cultures they recognize and are like, and, and even though those are fairly minor in the big scheme of things, right, 
uh, American culture dominates most everybody in in America, even if they are freshly from some other place. Nevertheless, yeah, Northern California, culturally speaking, is not the same, especially when you look at, uh, say, the Hispanics uh, as their own culture. There's there's far more of that culture in the South than in the North, and they do have a particular way of looking at the world. And it's different from the way a Silicon Valley, like Harvard educated person looks at the world as to how someone from San Gabriel looks at the world. And there's there's no reason to assume these people all think the same. I think a lot of outsiders, people who've never spent any time in California, have this view where everyone in California is this loony, crazy person who, who loves Hollywood mm-hmm. uh, or works in Silicon Valley or the San Francisco type person. And that's just simply not the case, even in the big cities in Southern California. Yeah, if you read Victor Davis Hanson, you can learn a lot about the inland parts of the state versus just four hours away, the the Bay Area, and just the cultural differences are unbelievably big. Uh, I just wonder, you know, we look at Croatia, for example, is one of the survivors of that seven country breakup. It's about 4.5 million people, but apparently it's physically smaller than West Virginia. So when, when we start to think about scale, you mentioned San Bernardino County. I mean, first, you and I would agree that California could easily be a country. Easily. With its ports and economy and per, per capita income and all, all kinds of things as industries. Uh, but within that, I'm not sure people understand the scale. I mean, San Berdu, as they say, could is, is probably more of a thing than Rhode Island. <laughs> easily. I, I think Americans have no sense of the scale, the, the size of the U.S. with 320 million people. Uh, the size of California with 40 million people, that makes it larger than every European country except mm. Germany, mm. UK, yeah. France, and Italy. I mean, yeah. that's <laughs> that's the size of Spain in terms of its population. But people people think that things can never happen until they do. It, people thought the former Soviet Union could never break up. And, and I would just add, when we look at California, you know, we think of Europe and European countries as being much older than the the U.S., but the actual geopolitical map of the current Western Europe is much younger than the U.S. A lot of that is post World War One, even post World War Two. So the idea that these lines are forever and ever isn't true. It's historically naive to think so. Well, it's amazing how short the memories are of <laughs> of people who talk about how oh well if you it's if you break up California. It, well, that's going to be permanent Democratic seats uh, for mm-hmm. California forever. And this is part of the reason, I think, why the, the pro-liberty party keeps losing. They can't think beyond like four or five years from now. We, we got to think we're talking about big, important issues like decentralization. But nope, you know, it might it might add a couple of Dems to the Dem column in the Senate. So forget it. We'll just we'll just keep the status quo forever. And and then, oh, California will always be a Democrat state. Uh, and will always be one piece. Well, that's certainly not what we were being told in the days of Pete Wilson. We were being told how California, had the, the Republicans had this death grip on the governor's mansion and things like that. And so, or in the 1990s, the early 90s, we were being told the Democrats have a permanent majority in the U.S. Congress. I mean, it, you don't have to be particularly old to remember that sort of thing. It was just 20, 25 years ago. And then things changed drastically overnight. And of course, bigger changes than that can happen when you look at Europe, as you know. But also people in California could be far better represented, I think, if the country split up. You could easily see a Green Party or Libertarian Party or Peace and Freedom Party or all kinds of third party people in some sort of broken up version of Sacramento, maybe a a tripartite Sacramento even. Um, Because as it currently stands, California mirrors the U.S. federal government and there's a winner take all system. There's two parties uh, and soon to be a supermajority of Democrats in the assembly in Sacramento. Well, they're just going to find divisions between Democrats, which would naturally lead to parties. So if you believe in third parties, if you believe the two-party duopoly is a bad thing, surely this is something that could help. Right. The fact that the U.S. is part of a much lo- – or the fact that California is part of a much larger – uh, entity somewhat negates those regional differences in the state. And a lot of political differences tend to be geographically regionally separated, but could also exist even within a single city. But it, it it's hard for any of those entities to exist when they're dealing with something so huge as the United States overall. And yeah, I would say experience shows that if you want to increase better local representation, 
And to really highlight the differences between some of these different groups, you get you got to be dealing with a smaller political entity because everything just gets washed out and dominated by huge national parties and huge national interest groups when everything is done and dominated by the national level. Right. But you notice that the powers that be really resist that. And it's not so much a left and right thing. I, you know, I mentioned that the LA Times article called it a radical plan. They didn't quote someone saying it's radical. They termed it radical in their headline. There's so much resistance to this and every, almost every facet of life is becoming decentralized other than governance. Right. And, and even in the libertarian sphere, a lot of people argue for universal political arrangements and that we should be going the other direction. We should be consolidating uh, governance and politics ac uh, across into, into supranational organizations, not breaking up into a bunch of little city states, which you and I might prefer. It's, it's interesting that the trend, the, uh, the trend among the cognoscenti seems to be the other direction. Well, that's what we're told in Europe, right? With Brexit was weirdly, we were being told that the democratic thing to do was to yeah. remove political control from a democratically elected parliament in the UK and give it over to a bunch of unelected uh, guys in the in the the European Commission and groups like that, faceless, nameless bureaucrats who mm -hmm. weren't really elected in any meaningful way, and that was that's what we're now being told is democracy. Yeah, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at it and you think this can't happen, that California can't break up, a lot of things couldn't happen five years ago that have happened, and it seems like the pace of these changes is accelerating. So I'm going to stay tuned. It almost makes me want to go back to California and illegally vote for this thing uh, in November just to see just to see what happens. But we'll we'll keep abreast of it. And as always, I think we will keep abreast of decentralization trends throughout Europe, throughout anywhere in the world, because uh, we the Mises Institute, most of us are certainly big believers, as as Mises was, that uh, self-determination is the highest political end. Uh, uh, not not end in life, but the highest political end uh, to be achieved. So with that, Ryan McMahon, thanks so much for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.